Hello, everybody. Turn this down just a little bit. Thanks to Ant House for uh, providing the music tonight. So <clears throat> let's hop. Let's hop into it. So in my time as a dungeon master, there's one question that keeps getting asked all the time, and it's how do I get started playing D&D? And there's a couple different things when you are wanting to get into D&D. Um, the number one thing is finding a group, and that can be anybody. That can be your your friends. You There's online communities in Roll20. There's several online communities you can get into where where people will allow random people into groups so get ready to play. There's some of them that are designed for um, new players and th those kind of situations. So, so the number one thing you want to do is first find a group, but the number two thing that you want to do is you got to build a character. And that's where we start losing people because there's a lot of options and the more books that are available, available to you, if you've got those uh if you got those hard copy books and you you're thumbing through those i remember back in the day uh second edition uh 2.5 3 those editions you start uh thumbing through the books and your your, your mind is just like who what am i do even doing this right and then somebody walks up hands you a bag of, of cheetos and a mountain dew and and a piece of paper and a pencil and it says Make your character. And that was about the extent of it back in the day. Thankfully, we have uh, companies like D&D &D Beyond that uh, have streamlined this process to make it so much easier and have all the options available to you. Now, as we get started today and start looking at all these different uh, options, please keep in mind, I have a lot of material to pick from. When you start building your character, there may be some things that I have that you won't have. Um, the, the folks that are in my campaigns, thanks to D&D Beyond subscription stuff, they get to share my books, just like you would if we were all sitting around a table and, and passing those out uh, to everyone uh, to, to build their character. So when you get started with yours, you create your account and get in there, you might be narrowed down quite a bit. Um, as we get going, if you have any questions, be, be sure to uh, just, just throw them there in chat. We'll be happy to to uh, answer those as soon as they come up, uh, and we're we're appreciative that you're here. So, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and, and and start looking at this. What what you're seeing here is the my uh, D and D Beyond is free. That's what's nice about it. Uh, its base level is free. The subscribers, there's some subscriber perks that get you uh, the ability to have build unlimited characters. You can see right here, it says my character slots. Uh, I have 15 characters currently build because I have a problem, uh, but uh, I can have unlimited characters. When you have the base package, I think you're limited to five or 10 characters that you can build. Um, there is a player level subscription that's not much at all. Um, the, the DM level subscription, the master tier, I think is what it's called. It's about 50 bucks for the year. So it's not, it's nothing crazy. And there's a lot of perks that come with that from discounts to books, um, to, to uh, dice, digital dice, which we'll talk about in a bit and um, things like that. But the big thing is that you can share your books with other people. So if you get your friend group together and they say, guys, Gals, we're going to play D&D. &D. Uh, someone has to be the DM. You throw a little bit of money together and, and get that master tier and start getting some books. You all start sharing them and the world is good. Um, so by default, you get a basic set of books. Let me. Yeah, share, uh, sharing with the DM access. Yeah, so as soon as you get that, and I think it's under uh, subscriptions here. At fifty-eight eighty-four every year, um, you get these bonus perks. Here's the here's the tiers. So your free tier, the one you start, 
Uh, you can get the, of course, you can purchase any content you want. You get access to the forums. And I, and I will say the the D&D Beyond forums are actually really good. There's a lot of really helpful people on there. Um, the, the creators of the site are very involved in letting you know what's going on. And, and so it's a great place to get some rule things kind of put out there. Uh, you get the live tool sets with the free tier. You don't get uh, early access to, to any of the new tools. That's for the other two tiers. Uh, characters, they, they all function, but you can only make six. So, uh, but you can still create homebrew content that you can share publicly. I do that a lot. Um, I plan on doing a video on that because that needs its own video all in itself. It is a process. Um, so we'll, we'll do some on that later. You can still create campaigns. You can join campaigns um, and create some encounters, which that, that's part of a, a DM video that we'll be doing later. Now, as you get into hero tier, you can see you get a little bit more. And it looks like, um, you know, you get everything except the ability to share your unlock content because that is the DM level tier, which is the master level, the dungeon master level. And you can share content um, up to five campaigns. And each of those is 12 players each. So theoretically, you could share your books with 60 people. That's a lot of people. Um, I can't imagine anyone in, in the uh, five campaigns at once. But that's a pretty good deal for, for a little monthly fee. Uh, it, it's... Uh, I use it a lot. And, and you know, when people say, Hey, I want to get into D and D beyond, you just have one of these little campaigns. You're like, here, here's a link to it. You'll have access to all my books, play around, build a character, see what it's like, you know, and then you can get rid of those campaigns later. So a lot of options there. And like I said, these, these are, uh, they added digital dice uh, about a year ago. I have mixed feelings on it, but it's really nice if you're traveling or don't have those physical dice there, or maybe you're just not ready to, to make that commitment um, to, to get some dice for for the, the table. Uh, so they have these digital dice, and they're super cool. We'll be rolling some later, but uh, they've got all these special effects, and then you get these neat backgrounds you can put on there. It's uh, it's really neat. Uh, let, me, let me show you some of these uh, dice, and, and we'll get into those later, uh, my dice. So I keep, they keep giving me free ones because I'm a subscriber. You'll start out with the basic black um, or the old screw. I got that one because I was part of the alpha. Uh, but dice of healing. It's little little containers of fluid. And the fluid rocks back and forth and they make a little sloshing sound. So they're, they're really neat. Um, I, from Icewind, you know, you get those and it has like a frost effect. Um, the cauldron dice are really neat. Uh, Memento Mori, or they're like these hard gravestone dice. And the Sanguine are the new ones, and they, they kind of squish as they hit. So, yeah, you, you get a, there's a lot here um, for that. So that's that's uh, some of the stuff about D&D Beyond. Like I said there's they have all the books on there. Um, they work very closely. The one thing that D&D Beyond ha doesn't have, though, if you're planning on playing online is a virtual tabletop and that's something that sorry to say that's a whole nother video because there's several that are out there on the market and they they all have their benefits uh and, and things like that but today uh we're, we're gonna focus on building that character because there, there's so much to that <laughs> better be more videos that's right that's right for sure so Without further ado, let's pop into that and, and we'll get down some rabbit trails, I'm sure, as we get we get on there. But you're going to build your account. You're going to come here and you're going to say, where do I go from here? Well, you're going to go to my characters. That obviously is a, a great place to start as a player. Uh, and you just right here at the top, my characters, create a character. Got to start somewhere. So we're going to click that. And you're going to meet th this kind of... Uh, screen it's got standard which you can check the box down here and it'll show you some help test text if you want to get some help while you're going through there kind of explain the the basics to you it's going to be your, the the choice that we're going to use today quick build 
it, it just kind of does some settings for you. Get you halfway there and then you fill in the rest. Um, and then randomize just everything's random. If you're playing in a one shot campaign and you're like, I need a character now, you hit randomize, it generates everything. There's your character sheet and you just roll with whatever it gave you. Uh, it would be insane to use that for a big campaign, but for a one shot uh, or, or just messing around with friends, it's, it's great for that. So we'll hop in here to standard and start looking at this. So you can see already we're met with several, several options to pick from. And we'll go through some of these. So I go in a little bit different order than this. And we'll talk about that when we get to the end. But it's all up to you. You can name your character right now. I usually wait. You can go back and forth these. These are not hard set. I can go over to choose my race and come back to home to choose other options. So you're not bound to anything until it's over. And then once it's over, you can always go back in and change stuff. You're going to have to do it when you level up anyways. So looking down through our options, D&D Beyond has grown quite a bit over the last couple of years, and they have a lot of content that's available. With that, you can see they have homebrew content Critical Role, a very famous uh, web show of D&D players. There's some of their content that's on there. Uh, play test. This is thing that's in that they're beta testing, things that they tend to change, uh, subclasses, uh, those kind of things. Rick and Morty. There's a whole entire Rick and Morty campaign. Something I'd like to play sometime. I'm sure it's uh, quite zany and it's it's things. And then you have your non-core. Uh, this is stuff that you usually want to talk with your DM is what's allowed in the campaign because there's so much. Um, typically, you're going to have Eberron content and the Magic the Gathering, those kind of things. Uh, but it's up to your to your DM uh, what's going to be acceptable. And not. There's some of the stuff that's in homebrew that's really crazy. You don't really want to go down that that route. Um, critical role content. There's not a ton, but there is some there. Uh, so choose your sources and, and you can always come back and check them if you think you're missing something. It's usually because one of those is unchecked. Next thing, in, enable digital dice rolling for this character. So you get into the age old di digital dice or physical. I love my physical dice. I love the feeling and the sound of dice rolling across the table. Um, but for the purpose of, of what we're doing today, we'll use our digital dice. We got it down here in the corner. If we look down here in the bottom left, you can see, let's see if I can make this a little bigger here. There we go. In the bottom left, oh, that's too big. Oh no, we're good. Never mind. We've got a little dice icon. When we click that, you can see here's all our, our different dice. So when you're playing D&D um, &D Beyond, or D&D, &D, um, you have these seven dice. That's why we're called 7D Dungeons. There's seven dice, 7D. You have a D4, which is a four-sided pyramid, also known as caltrops, because if you ever drop one on the floor and don't see it and step on it, it's a trip to the hospital. They hurt. They, <laughs> they hurt, especially if you get the metal ones, because you could tie those to the front of an arrow and fire it into a target. Um, <laughs> they are designed to do damage. So that's your D4. Uh, you got your D6. If you don't know what a D6 is, you might have been living under a rock for a while, because a D6 is your standard Monopoly dice. Okay, this is the, the dice you see everywhere, little dots on it. Everyone's seen a D6 at some point. I would hope. D8, start getting into those higher sides. So we got uh, our eight-sided dice. And then I'm going to skip over this one because that one's special. And then you go to the D10. And when you're talking D8, D10, nine times out of ten, you're dealing with uh, damage dice. So your weapons... Hey, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that follow. Appreciate it. Welcome. Welcome. If you got any questions, feel free. Hey, okay, Abe. Great. Uh, D6, D10, D12. All those are typically your damage dice. So you're going to be using when you're wielding weapons uh, or anything like that. Those are the dice you're going to be rolling. So 10-sided dice, 12-sided dice. And then you have the most famous, uh, the D20. Okay, so D20 is the workhorse of D&D. Uh, you're you're going to be rolling a D20 more than any other dice in the game. So get used to that one. 
and, and people have like dice rituals they do. I have my own. Um, there's this christenings of soaking them in Mountain Dew on a full moon. Look it up if you don't believe me. That's a real thing. Um, and then the last dice that you're going to work with is the D100, which is actually two dice. You're going to take a D100, which goes 10, 20, all, 0, 10, 20, all the way up to 90. And then typically you're going to roll this with a D10. There's two different methods of using those. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, it's not a, It's called the percentile dice. We don't use it uh, a lot, but there are, are conditions where you where you do. But dice rolling, if you want to use digital dice for rolling up this character, just check this dice rolling one and you'll be good to go. Now, a new setting we have here is optional features. So you have the ability now to customize your origin. There were some discussions that when you pick an orc, an orc is strong and he's dumb and whatever else. Well, not all orcs are strong and dumb. Uh, not all uh, orcs are, uh, you know, not all elves are small magical creatures. You know, so they've added the ability and supported it with the book to customize your origin. So you can say, I have a strong elf instead of a super smart elf, or I have a wise elf, a really charismatic elf. Um, so customize your origin. Hey, Panda, welcome. Stooge Foo, advantage on called shots. That's a pretty neat homebrew fee. I love homebrew. I do a lot of homebrew. Uh, our, our campaign is entirely homebrew, but I do a lot of homebrew weapons, creatures, those kind of things. So that's, that's pretty great, Abe. Eh? I like that. Uh, thanks for the follow, Pink. Uh, Topaz Panda, uh, glad to have you around. Uh, we're just getting into the beginning, so you haven't missed too much. Talked about some dice right now, talking about uh, customizing the origin. So customize your origin. If your DM allows it, just allows you to change some some of the, the stats, ability points. Typically, it'll say you have two ability points you can put somewhere. So I think that's a really neat feature, as well as optional class features. Um, so with the optional class features, there are some new ones that they've added in so that allows you to use those. Are they game breaking the ones I've seen? Nah, they just add a little bit more flavor. Monks have a couple things like that. So we're not going to use those right now because we're going to go. We're, we're trying to show just the basic. We're going to build a character on D&D Beyond. So the next one that we want to talk about is advancement type milestone and XP and people fight over these all the time. It's up, it's up to your dungeon master which one you're using. Um, XP is your dungeon master. When, when you're going to fight something, though, those creatures are worth an amount of experience. If you, if you defeat them in battle, at the end of the session, you get that experience added to your character. When you hit that threshold, you gain a level. They also give you experience points for good role playing. Kind of important for a role playing game. Uh, and anything, maybe heroic feats that you do, sacrificing yourself or putting yourself in harm's way for the party. Um, so it's a, a really a neat way to do it. Now, I prefer Milestone. Milestone's a little different. So if you've got a long story to tell, uh, what Milestone is, is your DM says, party, you did really good. You passed this particular threshold. You are now level two. You are now level three. So they tell you when you're going to level up. We don't deal with experience points. It's based on the story progression. So it's a little more control than everyone's leveling up at the same time. Is there one better than the other? Nah, six of one, half a dozen of the other. But it's whatever you like to like to play. It's still a great feature. Oh, yeah, hey, for, for sure. Uh, that, that one's a nice one. Hit point type, fixed and manual. I I prefer manual myself. Uh, that allows us to roll some dice up instead of using fixed values. And it tells you, are you sure you want to do this? Because this is this is a bit different. Yeah, we want to do it. We're we're good to go. Feats, multi class. Uh, we'll get into those in a little bit more depth later. Level scaled spells. 
those are some spells. It'll be like when you're uh, spell casting level one, it only does 1d8 uh, as you level up. Maybe it becomes 2d8 uh, when you hit level four. So they are, are you wanting to uh, use those with higher level spell slots? And do you want on your character sheet, do you want it to be displayed that way? Or do you just want it to be, I can cast fireball. And then when I read the, the, the text of it, it does more damage. Me, I like it that if I'm casting a level three fireball, it's it's calculating that damage out at the proper level. Less clicks. Less clicks are always better. Then we have encumbrance, and I promise we're almost through all this. This is just the first page, and it's better as we get through. So, encumbrance, are you going to use it? How much can your character hold? Ah, second edition. Ah, they're not. The second edition isn't too bad to pull into uh, fifth edition, though. A little bit of cleanup, but not terrible. So when you're using encumbrance, your character has a weight threshold that they can hold based on the, your strength number. Uh, yeah, most people do not like encumbrance. In my campaigns, when we play on Mondays at 7 o'clock, ding! Um, <laughs> We do not use encumbrance. There are times that your players are going to run into a situation like walking into a cave, defeating the dragon, and the dragon sets upon this massive hoard of gold and gems. Well, obviously, your characters aren't going to be able to stuff those in pockets and bags and walk out of the, the cave, you know, and their pockets are jingling every step they take. It's too much. You know, coin has a weight to it. And th those times you go ahead and do the math and say, you know, players, you can hold this much weight uh, before you start having to deal with encumbrance. That's a specialized encumbrance situation. For the most part, yes, you can carry, you know, swords and, and all your stuff, and it's not much of a issue. Um, so we're not going to do encumbrance. And we can even tell it, ignore the coin weight that way. Say 50 coins weighs one pound. Not a big problem at the beginning, but as you get going comes a big problem next it's how your ability scores we can swap this later uh, I like my scores on the top that way my big numbers at the top and my modifiers at the bottom and then character privacy this one is does the rest of your party can they open your character sheet and see what you got can they see you know what if they're browsing through your stuff through your character sheet if it's on public they can do it so if we go private it's private to just you Kind of an important step, if you ask me. So this is just kind of what we did here in the on the home page is we're just setting up the basics of all these other things we're going to do. So the next thing we're going to do is pick a race. Now, as I said, I have all the source books unlocked, so I have a lot of races that are here to pick from. As you see, as we go through these. There's several, and even going to half elf, <laughs> there's half elf is the base race, and then you have six variants under there. So there are several to pick from. What's the best one to play? Anything but a kinku. No, not a fan of kinkus. Very difficult to play. Don't pick a kinku as your favorite, as your character. But when someone says, What race should I play? The most important thing that I can tell you is play what is fun for you. You don't have to go with the best stats. One of our players, um, he plays a Minotaur Artificer. Minotaurs aren't typically known for being super smart and the magicians of the group. He went different. Um, so you can, you can do that. A, a lot of people will, will roll up their character or roll up their stats and then say, well, I'm, I, I need to pick a stat that gives a dex bonus because I'm a ranger and I need more dex. So it kind of pigeonholes you into uh, a, a race that may not be fun to play. I mean, you can play a Loxodon. It's an elephant. You walk around as a, a massive walking elephant, you, you know, and, and maybe that elephant is a, an evil sorcerer or, or something like that. Play what's fun. That's what's important. Um, Arakakra have have wings. They fly. 
bug bears. I like some a, a lot of the, the the monster races. You know, you got bug bears. Well, these these are things that that we fought for so long that are now playable races. Um, Ganassi, you know, be one with the elements. But and the, I would say the most like pigeonholed race class combo that that we see is Goliath Barbarian. Everyone thinks if you're a barbarian, you got to play a Goliath and you can blame critical role a little bit, or you can just say Goliath are there in the basic rules. They're available to use. They're big. They're strong. Makes sense. Why not be a Goliath Druid though? Or a Goliath uh, Cleric, you know, play what's right for you. Uh, so, and you can see they're adding other ones like fairy and, and uh, I got vampires now. Uh, there's vampires that you can play. Those were added in um, a new book that just came out. So that's that's a really neat one. They, that's it. Yeah, right here under lineages, Dompier, Hexblood, and Reborn. Uh, so you can actually play as like a zombie person now. All new stuff. Oh, do you? That that's awesome. Uh, I haven't had a chance to to play the the Dom Pier yet because uh, our, our campaign's been going on uh, about a year and a half now. So those having just come out, we haven't had anyone switch those. The reason I give the warning about the Kinku is Kinkus, while stat wise and kind of what they do, it's really difficult to play because they don't really talk they they only get mimicry so they can only say phrases that they've heard um that becomes really difficult from a player perspective and a lot of pre-planning to do so if you're a new player to dnd i would lean away from the the kinku for sure oh it's new yeah yeah uh they seem really cool. It seems like a, a really kind of broody, fun character to play. Um, and you can see they're they're rocking that new custom lineage stuff. So they're not they're not saying that you have to have stats in anything. So plus two to an ability score, plus one to some other one, and plus one to three other ones. So that that gives you some some flexibility there. You get your hungers. Um, which is pretty great. A little more custom customization than the standard races, but that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome that you uh, are, are are playing one of those already. For today's example, let's let's pick something classic. Um, we'll go dwarf. What's wrong with a dwarf? You'll take a gray dwarf, a Dulgar. So once you pick that. You can see they're bold and hardy, skilled warriors, miners, workers of stone and metal. And for some reason, all of them are Scottish. No matter what you think, they're all Scottish. No, just kidding. But that's typically the voice you hear uh, from those. The Dorgar, though, live and come from the Underdark. Uh, underdark. A, a Dungeons and Dragons soup. That's that's interesting. Uh, for sure, for sure. But we can see, we can see through those and you can see here's some of their abilities. They get Dwarven Resilience, Combat Training, anytime, and you'll see this with the class as well, that you have this blue outline around the tool proficiency. That means there's something in there you need to select. So we're going to open this up. And it says, oh, I need to choose a Dwarf's Artesian tool. Is my character good at uh, brewing? Is my character good at doing some masonry work or smith tools? I think I think he's, he's good at brewing. So maybe on the adventure, he'd take some time, brew some stuff on the side. That's important. So... If we don't want to play the dwarf, we can always hit change race and pick another race. But right now, we're going to play our Dugar and choose a class. Now, 
there are several, as you can see, several base classes, but keep in mind, every base class has at least three, some of them up to nine uh, subclasses to further specialize your character. So there's no such thing as just a barbarian. You're only a barbarian till about level three. And at that point, you got to pick a subclass. Um, so you have to think, what do I want to play? And there's a lot of variety. And one of the ones I hear, um, that I hear that's a, a little funny is like, well, I don't, I don't want to be a fighter. Fighters are boring. Fighters have so many options that are in there. Let, let's take a look at fighter. Let's say fighter. And we can see, oh, they get action surge. We'll, we'll just go ahead and add this class and take a look. So they got to pick a fighting style, but let's pop it up to level three to show you what I'm talking about here. Martial archetype. This is your where you choose. Now I'm not just, oh, I'm, I am definitely not opposed to barbarian. I love barbarian. In fact, the wild magic barbarian that they have now, I think would be hilarious and fun to play. Um, that's, that is a, a character I want to play in the very near future. Um, barbarians are, are tough, but look at all these options that we have in here. So here is a fighter, but you're an arcane archer. So it's more ranger ish, but a fighter battle master, you're controlling the battlefield. You have dice. You can roll, uh, to control those gunslingers, a critical role, uh, subclass fun with guns if they're allowed Eberron campaigns that that's, is typically allowed cavalier champion eldritch knight you get some spells story time uh, as i like to say it when i first started playing DD again i played early on in my childhood i started playing again in 5e i made an eldritch knight fighter and the friends i was with they're like "Ooh, why would you do that um because they only get a couple spell slots and that you know obviously isn't their main thing to do where the value really comes in is when you're when you're lower level like that and you go to attack something and you're a fighter and you're standing out front taking the the brunt of the damage and you cast shield giving you five to your ac until it's your turn again the eldritch knight becomes a pretty viable option um for for a few rounds at least uh so it, it's it's all about thinking about what would be fun to play uh so again the, the common thing what should i play play what's fun the number one rule of DD is play what's fun have fun so we also have monster hunter those are fun purple dragon knights samurai one of my players is is currently a samurai and they're just they're just monsters on the battlefield um so remember that that these classes most of them this happens at level three um as you uh, some of them happen right at level one like picking your college or your study as a as a wizard uh so keep in mind that you want to go in here to the game rules before you start building your character and kind of know what you want to play so if we click into wizard or, or something like that, we'll be able to see all those subclasses so that you can plan out what you want to do. In this case, I didn't want to be a fighter. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit this red X and hit confirm. Now D and D beyond does support multi-classing. Uh, never as a new player, should you start out multi-classing? That's a lot of work. Um, and, and there's some, some rules that are kind of based around that, uh, uh, of how that works. Uh, one of my other players is is a multi-class uh, fighter monk, and there's definitely some some things you got to wrap your head around about when you get particular skills, when you don't. So, for for this case, uh, I'm a duogar. Let's go barbarian. I've been talking barbarian. Let's go barbarian. Barbarians get rage. So, not only do they get rage, they also get one of the highest hit point dice. Uh, uh, of the of the classes they get their hit point dice is a d12 so i look down what else do they get they get unarmored defense so when they're not wearing armor when they're naked 
Their armor class is 10 plus their dex and constitution modifier. So I want to make sure that as my barbarian, I've got high dex, high constitution. Gives me that. Um, and if I have a shield on, I can even continue um, with that reckless attack. Uh, so you can continue attacking danger sense and then of course you get your ability score proven so we're gonna add that class and because it, and this is this is an important thing to talk with your your dm and i see this on twitter every now and then people are are talking about um what what level do you want to start a character out at level one and level two are really hard levels for dnd players especially new dnd players because you don't have very many hit points a goblin can wipe the group uh, if the roll of the dice uh, determines that. So, so typically, for my players, we all start at level three. So I'm going to choose level three, and now I see I have Primal Path. So because it's got the blue outline around it, do I want to pick Path of the Juggernaut, the Totem Warrior, Storm Herald, Battle Rager? I'm, of course, going to go Wild Magic. I was just talking about that. And with that, when I choose that, I gain a few new feats. I get the Magic Awareness and Wild Surge. So basically, when I'm attacking, when I enter a rage, I have to roll that D8. So I'm going to come over here. Grab my D8 and roll it. And this is what happens to me when I go into rage. Until your rage ends, you're surrounded by multicolored protective lights. You gain a plus one bonus to AC. And while within 10 feet of you, your allies gain the same bonus. That's amazing. That's so much fun. So that's what I want my Dugar to be. And I see, oh, I've got another one up here. Proficiencies. Choose a barbarian skill. Well, what uh, what is he good at? Well, he's good at surviving out in the wild. He's from the Underdark, of course. He's got to be good at, at some survival things. It's, it's rough under there. And let's see. Probably not nature. Not a whole lot of nature under there. Animals. Uh, but he is a Dugar. He's good at intimidation. So, no more blue there, but a very often missed step is manage HP. So if you remember when we were on the home one, we chose not to go with fixed HP. We decided to go with manual HP, so we need to manage that. What we do here at Seven Dungeons when a character roll, we roll up a new character, for your first level, your level one character, you always get the max HP dice. Okay, so I, I would start as my rolled HP as being 12. Because imagine rolling a one on a hit point dice. You're starting out at level one as a barbarian with one hit point. Now, according to the DM guide, if a creature hits you for more than double your max hit points, you are instantly dead. No death saving throws. So all a goblet has to do is hit you with a rock for three points of damage. Your character's instantly dead. That's not really fun. So for level one characters, we always say you get the max. You don't have to do that. The other thing we do is we don't allow rolls of one for your hit point dice. So if you roll for your hit, hit points, this next part I'm about to show you, and you roll a one, we have you re-roll it. Because when you're going from two to three or three to four, etc., getting one hit point, that's that's rough. Uh, just doesn't feel like uh, you're really gaining anything. So now if it's two, you're stuck. Sorry, your, your guy just isn't as hardy as everyone else. So in this case, it's a, a level three. Um, so I'm going to come in here. And I need to roll two D12s because I'm level three. My first one was maxed out. Now I got to roll the other two. All right, I got 16. So I'm gonna got to add that 16 to my 12. 
for 28. Now, I don't add my HP modifiers, any of that. All the constitution modifiers that we'll have will get automatically added. So all I have to worry about is me rolling my hit points. So right now I have 28 hit points because I don't have any ability scores. So it, that is what it is. They will go up as my constitution goes up. Um, Panda, the HP on level one, I always have my players get the max HP amount. So if you're a wizard, your hit points starting out at level one are going to be eight. If you're a barbarian, they're going to be 12. It just it at least gets you started on the right foot uh, before you start adding constitution modifiers and, and things like that. So it's nobody wants to start out their game with their first character and, and get a really crappy hit point roll. Yeah, fifth fifth level, 41 hit points. You know, that's... And, and I know a lot of uh, players, the players I play with, that's the way they do it too. They're level one, you don't even roll for hit points. You just get whatever the max hit points that are available there. So, Barbarian, D12, 12 hit points. So now that I've picked this, and I don't have any other blue things, now I may want to say, oh, what, what else is coming for my character? Um, well, yeah, once we get our con in, it'll go in there, but I'm not sure it's a, it's in the rule rule that you get that. Uh, I'd have to look. Uh, but you'll get your con modifier once we get some ability scores in there. So through my journey as a barbarian, if I click the plus down here, available at higher levels, I can see what's coming. So as I, oh, a fifth level, I'm going to get an extra attack. I get some better movement uh, all the way down. And I can read those till I get down to the 20, 20th level. If you have a spellcaster, you will have a separate thing here. We'll go back and do, do this. Um, it's on all the class info. Is it? Let's take a look. Um, choose Barbarian. We'll open that in a new tab. So here's this. Ah, yeah, it is. You are correct. I had never really missed that. So it's a, it's in the book now. So thanks. I didn't know that. At least I've been doing it right all this time. <laughs> so, well done. All right, let's go back. And we'll come back to this barbarian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless, you're, unless you multi-class. <laughs> it gets rough then. Um... So let's pick a wizard and you'll see now we have the spell list. So when we go up to here and, and I see a lot of players miss this little tab when they're working with the ND beyond is the spell. So let's pick an arcane tradition. We will go enchantment and you go over to spells and you'll see your prepared spells are none and spellbook none. So I have to add spells. Now when I click add spells, it says I need to pick, I have zero of three cantrips picked and zero of three prepared spells. And here's all the spells I have to pick from. So to begin with, what I like to do is filter them down. So I'm just looking at cantrip, which are zero level spells. And you have all these to pick from. So you just click learn. I want that one, that one, and that one. And you'll see they all gray out because I can't have more than three in this case. And then prepared spells, I have first and second level prepared spells. And I have to pick those. So don't forget your spell tab. So go back here. Pick, go back to picking my primal path here. And my proficiencies, we were Intimidation and Survival for my Durgar.
All right, so we are ready to move on to the next one. Ability scores. So there's a couple different ways people do this, and I've seen arguments either ways. You have the standard array, manual rolled, or point by. If you go to point by, you have 27 points to spend. And when you drop down, you can say, I want this much in strength, this much in dex, and each one costs a set of points. So if I go here, here, and here, then my intelligence, wisdom, and charisma are all eights, and as high as I can go is 15. This is one way to do it. Uh, after you choose your score, the racial modifiers get added in and you see the total score at the top. So my strength is at 16, 15, and 17. Uh, when you have those scores, you get one to your modifier for every even leveled score. So in this case, you can see we have 16 and those all start at 12. So 12, we get plus one, 14, we get plus two, and 16, we get plus three. At 15, you see we're still plus two and 17 plus three. All of these scores go up to a 20 naturally. There are magical means that can raise it above the 20. Uh, and at 20, it is plus five. So for those important stats that we looked at earlier, dex and constitution, you want those to be high. Most folks will do the rolled uh, system. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and roll and you roll 4d6 and drop the lowest. That gives us our dice to work with. This is actually not a bad, bad set of rolls. I love rolling for stats. I, I think it's, it's really fun. Build some uniqueness to work with. Now, we use uh, a, a critical, I think it's a critical roll rule. Uh, because, again, you never want a character to go in and he's got three and everything um, and you're just worthless to the group and to yourself. Uh, if you add all these numbers up, if they're not higher than 72, then we have the character reroll uh, their abilities because 72 is a good, good baseline uh, for things. You should probably have more than that, but it keeps... Uh, and we've had players have 73 and that's fine 74 and it at least keeps the player's character starting off on a good foot point by is great i mean it's it's fair there there's nothing wrong with it at all uh i i just mainly i grew up on on use rolling for them and that's what I prefer. And and this seems to be one of the best methods is just roll four, drop the lowest, 4d6 and drop the lowest. So now that we've rolled these in D&D Beyond, we can assign them. So I've got my uh, my barbarian here. What's important to him? Well, his, his strength's important and constitution is important and dex is important. So I want my highest ones to those. Now, uh, he's going to be intimidating people. Intimidation is one of his uh, things. So we'll make his charisma the next higher one. And then make his wisdom 10, his intelligence 12. And then I hit apply ability scores. And from there I can see where we're at. 18, 16, 19. He's a hardy, hardy dwarf. And we are ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's where I, I'm not a, a, a huge fan of the digital dice. But uh, you, you got to be able to trust your players not doing anything fishy like that. Uh, for sure. That's why, and I'll say this, uh, a session zero is so important. And uh, what what that is is rolling up characters, explaining what you expect from your players, exp the players explaining what they expect out of their DM, and just kind of laying the ground rules out in the beginning because there's a lot of little nuances to all this. When we talk about um, uh, when we do another video session of so we'll call it so you're the DM, uh, and we talk about you know setting up encounters and, and DMing for for a group. 
there's a lot of little nuances and, and, and optional rules and like diagonal movement. Um, are you going to, is that move normal or do you use the optional rule where it's, you know, there's some spaces there. So there's, there's uh, a lot of little different things. So keep those in mind. So now that we've got our, our stats all rolled up, we're going to hit this next button. And we don't even have a name yet. So since we're here in the description, let's pick a picture. So we click the little plus and what fits for him. He's an, he's an angry and give him a name. We'll just call him stone stone under rock. So you can use the randomizer, click and randomize, uh, use this fantasy name generator. Uh, I like just coming up with something. I have so many. Yeah, yeah. Um, as Sikoski's saying, it, six, the digital dice do tend to roll higher than real dice in, in our experience. It, it's... They seem to have a higher average or favor particular stats. I know I use them in a in a campaign where I'm a player, and when I attack, the digital dice are all on my side. They love me, uh, but when I roll any skill checks, it, it, they're ridiculously low. The they don't even out very well. That's why I'm kind of leery of them a bit. Um. So now that now that we have our, our character name, we got our character picture, we choose a background. Now there, as you can see, tons of background. And this is just to help for flavor. Uh, you're going to gain some abilities from it, but where did your uh, character come from? Was he a sailor? Was she a soldier or, or a bounty hunter? Or was she a Water Davian noble that maybe lost her way or dishonored her family? Um, is he haunted by, by a dark past with former gladiator or a folk hero? Pick which, uh, what fits your, how you want your character to be, where you want them to, to come from. Um, in this case, let's see. He was a gladiator. He was pulled from the underdark and made to fight in a gladiatorial arena in water deep gets a disguise kit and he carries around a pan flute. So we can click the first thing under there uh, and, and see that a few things about the background, some suggested characteristics. So you want your character, when you're making your character, you want them to have a personality. Now, a lot of people will just use what's here, the suggested characteristics. You don't have to have those, but you want to have your own personality and you want to have some ideals that your character believes in. And then uh, you want to have flaws as well. No, Nobody's perfect. Just like people, nobody's perfect. So choose two. So this gladiator, um, hey. He's a gladiator. He'd love a good insult. Even one directed at himself. He, he'd enjoy it. Um, but he's a perfectionist. So would not doesn't tolerate uh, fooling around. So then his ideals. Is he good? Is he lawful? Is he chaotic? Either good or evil. Uh, what's he what's he what drives him to do what he does? Um, eh, honesty. Well, that's not him. Tradition. He believes in the traditions that he learned coming up from the Underdark and being made to fight in the arenas. Yeah, e e exactly. Uh, Sikoski, they, uh, you definitely want it to, to fit. You want to have that personality in in mind before um, 
before you start picking some of these options. Yeah, because if you're if you're playing a, a a nasty barbarian, you don't want to pick one that's art reflects my soul. Uh, maybe not. I mean, combat's an art form for sure. So pick that. Then we have bonds. What is what is something that that he loves? Does he want to be famous? For him, he idolizes a hero of the old tales. So he's always comparing himself to someone from the back. And, and this will all play into your backstory once you get there. And then what's his what's his flaw? Um, does does he uh, frequent the brothels? Is that is that his flaws? Um, does he have a problem keeping his true feelings hidden, which causes him not to to you know, speak too kindly to the others in the party. Um, maybe he's unreliable. Maybe he's got a drinking problem. My barbarian, he's unreliable. So now that we've got some of those character details, and this is all the role playing stuff, alignments. Now, I, I th would say. Yes, yes, exactly, Panda. I, I mentioned that at the beginning. You don't have to use these that are there. You can definitely write in your own. Um, that, that it's not bound to just those ones that are, are there. Those are just kind of to get you off for the uh, starting point, get that character made up. Alignment. Uh, it, it seems to not have the, the power that it once had. And... Hey, Master Brewer, welcome. And, but I, it's still very important. And as a DM for, for our campaign, I take it into play. If your character is one of these alignments, I expect you to kind of play that way. Um, and it changes how the NPCs would react to you as a player. Uh, oh, that's awesome, Pink. So, there are uh, hundreds of videos that are out there about alignment and who fits what and how you play alignments and all those. So I, I, I could do a video thing on just alignments and how I feel about alignments. Uh, but pick what fits your character. As a new player or a new DM, I would not allow my players to play a, an evil alignment. Uh, it's just unnatural uh, as, a, as a human to be cruel or, or overly selfish uh, in those ways. Um, my more experienced players, I definitely let them play evil alignments. But uh, newer players, keeping that neutral uh, and uh, good range and, and then kind of modify it from there for the next one. So, yeah. Uh, by the way, we, we will be posting this up on, on our YouTube channel, uh, Seven, Seven Dungeons. Um, so... Well, you'll be able to access it there if you miss anything else as well. So this player, he uh, he's lawful but neutral. He acts in accordance with the laws and traditions of the land, but uh, he's not not one that goes out to save the princess or uh, finds a princess in the other uh, in another castle. Faith, they don't really put a lot into this anymore a lot of times i will google uh 5e gods and things if you if you want to have a faith um and put it in there but it just doesn't play in as much as it used to so i know this would be a terrible choice choice for this guy but we'll go with dolor and then one of the things that it it really should fanboy it really should uh it should uh play in a lot more than it does in, in our campaign I, it definitely is a thing bahamut and um ishtab for some uh but I, I wish it was more of a drop down option with the gods that are available in the pantheon yeah right right so lifestyle and this is something as a DM, I am terrible at maintaining. But what kind of lifestyle did you come from? What, what type of lifestyle uh, do you typically lead? You know, are you poor? You don't go with typical comforts and it costs you so much per week. 
don't usually bother with it. Usually you're out in a dungeon somewhere anyways, or crawling through a woods or something. It's not like you're sitting in a house somewhere. Uh, it, it becomes more if you, if the characters end up buying a place and maintaining it and hiring people to work there and, and those kind of things. But for the most part, I wouldn't put a whole lot of thing into lifestyle. But if as a new player, you say you're wealthy, make sure you uh, communicate that to your DM because if you stick around in the town for a while, you may have to pay that uh, four or, or 10 gold there for it per week. Yeah. No, no, it's not per day. I, I don't, I don't believe. It's been a while. That's how much I ignore it. So from there, physical characteristics, what do they look like? This hair's white, skin's blue, classic Dugar. Eyes are black. How high, is, how tall is he? Five foot seven. Sure. How many pounds? And he's 50. Right, right. And then whatever gender you want to put there. So now if we go down to our personality characteristics, you can see here's the ones we pick from the list. And like Panda was saying, thanks for stopping by, Abe. As Panda was saying, uh, if you want to edit these, you can just edit them. You don't have to use the ones that are there. Just hit edit and you can change them up here. You can manually change them to what you need. As long as you have them, that's what's important. You want your character to have a personality. You're not a rock. Unless you're a pet rock. And then it just gets weird. When it comes to notes, unless you've got some kind of weaved-in backstory where you have attachments to an organization, allies, enemies, or other, these are things you fill out as you're playing the game. You're not going to fill them out here. Minus one very important one, at least to me, and that's the backstory. Your character comes from somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, it can be the tragic backstory. My family, they were killed by Goliath. Uh, a, a marauding band of pirate Goliaths came in, slaughtered your family. They took you and raised you, you know, and taught you how to fight. And then when you got old enough, you killed them in their sleep and and now you've been on the run ever since. Y y you know, whatever it be. It, it could be, I've been a farmer my entire life. And, you know, after my family passed or the crops, you know, gave out, I went to the city looking for adventure. It doesn't have to be a tragic backstory every time. Oh, Panda, I, I, I did something like that as well. I In the very beginning, so so our campaign that we run on Mondays, that, that we stream on Twitch on Mondays, um, it started out as a one-shot. And as we were playing, it, we finished the one-shot because I was introducing them to D&D, and they're like, oh, we can't stop there. We got to keep playing. And it ended up into the stream. Um, but I had given out uh, these magical items not even looking up what their value was. And then when, when we finally got further into the campaign, they were like, we should sell this stuff. And I'm looking in this book going, Oh, Oh God, this is bad. <laughs> this is, there's a, there's a PDF out there. You can find it's uh, sane magical prices. It's really good. Um, because the, the core books just don't give you good prices for magical items. So you go in there and, Thankfully, it's under control now. <laughs> Value is something. Oh, that's what you use too. Yeah, it's a really good resource. I don't understand why Wizards of the Coast doesn't incorporate. I mean, buy it, buy the rights to it or something. Put it in the books. If people want to know what things cost, you know, um, at least a general amount of some sort because uh, it gets crazy. But backstory have one it doesn't have to be uh in fact there was a a little tweet going around today out there of like 
how long of a backstory do you let your players write? You know, and some people are like, uh, I make it, I make them only have a paragraph and that's it. I don't care if it's a paragraph. I don't care if it's a mini novel. Let me know what your care, where your character comes from. Um, it, it's funny because one of my players in our campaign, he wrote up this very extensive background. And as I'm looking at this, I wanted to weave parts of that into the story because I didn't have an overarching story at the time. And there were things in there that he had put that his character had experienced that I was like, you know what? There's my story. It's right there. I'll take what he put in his and it's become part of the story. Now it's a big part of the story. So it, uh, let your players' minds flow. That's their world. That's their playground to play in. And, you know, you take that and, and weave it into yours. That's their opportunity to do little mini DMing of themselves. So it's an important thing. So once you get all of this set up about your character, you can go to equipment. So D&D Beyond will give you the choice to choose equipment or gold. And some DMs will do a gold buy system. They'll say you have X amount of gold. Uh, here's the equipment list. You can buy, you know, till you're out of gold, whatever it is. Um, can there be a Battletoads theme campaign? Actually, yes. Uh, there is a frog race that has to be in water so long per day and it's like they're they're poison frogs um so you technically could do you could do a battle toads campaign you could also do a ninja turtle campaign because of the turtles um i'm a big fan of the turtles so yeah yeah um sakoski there uh me and him worked together and actually made a knoll race um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. We homebrewed that and it worked out really well. It was, it was extensive. Like the, it was not like the other ones, but yeah, Knowles. Yeah, it was, it was so good. It was so good. Um, <laughs> right, right. But typically, uh, you're going to just hit equipment when you hit equipment says you're a barbarian here's your starting equipment do you want a great axe or any martial melee weapon so i want a great axe and then do i want two hand axes if i choose any simple weapon i just got to come down here and pick one you know do i carry a, a mace on my side or, or maybe a dagger to pick my teeth or or whatever I'll choose a dagger and then it gives you Explorer's Pack or Dungeoneer's Pack. Uh, sometimes you get a pick. Yeah, so, so Panda, they uh, everyone does it a, a little different, uh, it, it seems, when it comes down to equipment. This seems to be the, the easier method for me because uh, they're all everyone's starting out as kind of a, a baseline, very basic equipment, and it allows me to, to kind of manage stuff from there. Uh, in order of found loot and that kind of stuff but I've seen the method you're you're talking about there uh, for sure and they all work they do and this but this just gives them the, their basic they get 10 days of rations you know torches water skins backpacks bed rolls all that fun stuff that you can take away when they get captured by goblins and drug off into the woods and served as food to the orcs um anyways nothing specific there but then um oh yeah oh yeah curse of straw let me tell you about curse of straw uh Skoski here that was uh one of our he he dm'd curse of straw for for us and i played one of my favorite characters ever which was um Nadani slash Steve, the uh, multiple personality warlock. Um, Curse of Strahd is no freaking joke. If you have, if you're gonna play Curse of Strahd, give your players a little extra, show them some love from the beginning. 
it, it's it does not start out pleasant. Um, there's a lot there. Um, a, a, to quote from from the Elf movie, it smells like mushrooms and everyone wants to hurt you. Um, that's that's Barovia. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Curse of Strahd. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot there, and for a horror campaign, especially with the new Ravenloft material that's out there, um, there's so much you can do there. Uh, he'll never forget the dolls. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, he homebrewed a um, a patron for me for my warlock, and it was so good. And yeah, didn't get to play it. But now that we've picked our starting equipment, you can see my background as a gladiator gets me a couple other extra stuff. Uh, an inexpensive but unusual weapon, which can be fun. You work with your DM for that or a musical weapon. So yeah, he's, let's see, unusual. Maybe he carry, yeah, he carries a laser rifle. Yeah, this is why you have to look at your character sheets before you start so that when you're playing and you're fighting goblins, uh, the ranger doesn't say, I pull out my laser rifle. Um, <laughs> so, uh, maybe he carries a net. That's usual. And he carries a lock of hair from a love that he lost in the Underdark when they, when they took him. And then when it comes down to how much money they have, you can give them a pouch of 15 gold pieces, or you can start them more, more squalid than that. Uh, how do you rule HP potions as of HP given back? No, they roll it up. Uh, 2d4 plus 4 or whatever it is for the different potion types. Uh, they don't get the max. And it is an action during combat is how we run it. To, to use a, a piece of equipment like that. Once, uh, once you get that set, add my starting equipment. Yeah, yeah, it is 50 gold pieces for the potions. Yeah, it's ridiculous. They should be cheaper than that, but at least for this campaign, just running by raw. So now that we've added the starting equipment, you'll see active items is zero. Inventory is 13. So we're going to open this up and you're going to see here's all these weapons I picked earlier. So to show up on your character sheet in the right spot, we want to wield that great axe. We want to wield those jab javelins. I only got four of them. Dagger. We'll have our net ready. And if there's any armor, you would want to wheel put that on there as well. So then the active items, we have our four pieces. Once that's done, you're pretty much done making your character. When you hit next, it says, what do you want to do? Do you want to export it to PDF, print it out, go play, or view your character sheet? So we're going to view our character sheet. Now, all those things we just did are right here in front of you. So as before, you saw I rolled up. Uh, we had a total because I rolled 16 on my two hit point dice. Um, and then I started with a base 12. So with my constitution modifier, I'm at 40 hit points. What does wielding mean? Wielding just means it, it puts it in your actions list so that you can use it for combat. Yeah, he, he's got all those. But it's not that he's holding them at all all the time. It's it's available for, for doing an attack. So if you put your great axe away and grab a dagger out to do a dagger action, you're not digging through to find the stuff. So the, the good thing is everything, the way they have it grouped up is you have your actions. So you have all this stuff here. And if you're using digital dice, you can say, I'm going to attack with my great axe. I'm going to roll my hit. It's going to roll that big old dice. 21 I hit now I'm gonna roll this up and it does all the math for you so I hit for nine points with my great axe that's the one thing that's nice about using the digital dice is it's doing all that math for you so 
if you remember when we started, where do we want, how do we want it to display our scores? I like my modifiers in the small circle at the bottom. And then you have your actual scores as the big numbers. If I click that, it'll roll that. So if your DM ever says, hey, I need you to roll a strength check, just a strength check, you're just going to click that number. Yeah, the, the click sheets are, are freaking great. If I click outside of that, though, and a little bit of this block by my block here, what it does is it tells you, here's my strength, it's 18, I have a plus four modifier, and where I'm getting those bonuses from, and then what strength does. So that it's a really nice write-up for, for these things. And you can choose if you want it to fly out when you click it, or you can click here to make it fixed, and now it's on the screen all the time. So when I click, oh, what's animal handling? So I click that, and it tells me what animal, animal handling, handling does. The little dots show that your proficiency in those skills, you pick those during character creation. So this one, because acrobatics was in the list, I am proficient in acrobatics, so I get my modifier plus my my uh, proficiency bonus. So I have a plus three to my dex, so that gets plus three here, plus two to my proficiency because I'm proficient in acrobatics, giving me a bonus of plus five. Dang, I'm rolling really good. Digital dice uh, for 21 for that check. On the left hand side, these are your saves. So if something casts a spell at you uh, or requires you to make that save, you just click the dot. And this guy would have survived. Also underneath those, you'll see if you ever see uh, around here, the the A, that means you have advantage against something. OK, and what advantage does is you roll a D20 twice and you take the higher roll. So that's a good thing. So it helps save a lot of people. If you have disadvantage marked by a, a little red uh, D on there, you roll 2D20 and take the lower value. Terrible. I've seen folks and even myself roll a nat 20 on one and a nat one on the second one and then have disadvantage and wah, wah, done. Passive uh, wisdom perception. <laughs> My players uh, will troll me on this just a bit. I'm not a huge fan of the passive stats. Uh, a, a passive perception, investigation, and insight is not the same as rolling investigation, perception, and insight. It's the things you just natively see while you're walking about, the corner of your eye kind of thing, but it's not the same as actively looking for a particular thing. So it might be, you know, did you see, um, while you were in town, did you see any dragonborn there? Your passive perception would say, yes, you did, or no, you didn't. Um, passive perception is the, the biggest one that I get trolled on. Uh, so no roll up. You can click those and you can see uh, the write up on, on those, on the passive things. Yeah, it, Pan, I agree. They're too much. They're too much. I'm not, I'm not a fan. Uh, uh, a fan it, it gets what it does is it puts everything in a gray area because what the what they'll do is they'll roll perception and get like a four and they're like but my passage perception passive perception is 16 well your passive perception doesn't count here you're that's just kind of passively looking at stuff so it doesn't you're not looking for that trap or that puzzle or that uh, information kind of thing so we use it but it's more as a joke than anything else. Armor. This is the type of armor you can wear. Of course, I'm a barbarian, so I'm not going to be wearing it. But some barbarians have been known to put armor on. The type of weapons you can use. And you can click those and see. And, of course, the languages that you can speak. Your walking distance. And that goes up. So that's your normal movement. When you're moving across the grid, uh, each square, if you use squares, is five feet of movement. You can also use hex tiles as well. Um, 
I've never done the hex tiles. I've always done the, the squares. And again, like I said earlier, if you're doing diagonal rules and everything, you want to set that up before you start playing your campaign. Yeah, that is a great analogy, Panda. That is, passive states are are equal to Electrum coins. Please don't mess with Electrum currency. It just it's just weird that it's even there. It doesn't need to be there. Uh inspiration that's a bards typically give inspiration inspiration is another thing your dm can give you though if you do something that's really good they're like hey you just inspired the party maybe you know you get inspiration which you can use to give yourself advantage on something if you do get hit by something on D, &D beyond so you type in your damage i was hit for four points of damage so i hit the number and i hit damage and you'll see that reduces my current hit points if you have temporary hit points, you can type those in. And now you can see I've got 10 temporary hit points and those will reset when you take a short or long rest. Your AC, your armor class, that's the number that an enemy has to roll equal or above to hit you. So in this character, being a level three character with 17 AC is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good for that level. Um, so that means the goblin, when he's going in to attack you, has to roll over that with modifiers and things. And that's where we get down to what these mean. Your two hit modifier is after you roll the d20 to attack, what number gets added to that roll to see if you're above the armor class of the thing you're fighting. So you want that to be a good number, best as you can get it. <laughs> And after you hit is when you roll the damage. So you, you'd roll that up. <laughs> yeah, Grayson inspires all day with, I punch him in the face. Unarmed, uh, that's, a, that's a little bit different. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's for sure, Panda. So you can roll down and see all your abilities. If you use ability, so I go into combat and I say, I want to rage. I click that box and you can see that I only get three uses of that before I need to take a long rest to refresh those. Um, short rest is an hour or shorter and only certain things refresh on a short rest, but you can use your hit point dice to get some hit points back. A long rest is eight hours plus, um, and you got to be careful where you're camping because you, you don't just sit down in the middle of a dungeon and say, you know what, I'm hurting pretty bad. Let's build us a fire. Let's get uh, get some stuff roasting up here. I'm sure we'll be fine for the next eight hours because that's a good way for the raiding party to come and and attack you while you're sleeping. How many short rests per long rest? Um, I've never had a limit on short rest per long rest. I mean, there's a point where you're, you're going to get into, there's only so many hours in a day. Uh, so if you're short resting all the time, hour, 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 uh, I don't know if there's just a, a number um, for that. Yeah, yeah. We are going to get on the, the hit point discussion here and how those get restored on a long rest, but... Uh, that's that's a little bone of con yeah i i've never i think panda i think it's just because it's never happened i've never had players excessively take short rests where i go to look at it a lot of uh dming is being reactionary unfortunately to to some of the situations and you're like oh i'm not sure i need to look that up uh if, if you can do that or not and then now you have a standard to go off of but i've never had the players just just really slam out the short rest um, so I don't know. I'll have to look that up now. I'm interested to know if there is a hard set limit for that. Um, okay. The next thing, when you start in everything on your character sheet will say all, and you'll see your weapons and abilities. You can close this down and filter it 
by just showing I want to do an attack. If I do an attack, these are the things that are available to me. I just want to do an action. These are my actions that are available to me. Right, Panda, for sure, for sure. But you wouldn't get the benefit of a long rest because it's a bunch of little short rests. Um, so actions. This is a really overlooked part of the actions, which is the actions in combat. Most people say, I want to cast a spell, I want to attack. But they forget that they can disengage, which is backing away from a from a, something attacking you and not taking uh, an opportunity attack against yourself. Uh, dash, which is another 25 feet of movement uh, as an action. Dodge, you have disadvantage on attacks against you for, for a round. Um, grapple, you know, going in and grabbing a hold of something and trying to hold it in place. Help is probably the most overlooked one because that gives advantage to to someone that you're you're helping. Hiding is pretty common. Uh, improvising is very rare. Readying a, an attack—that's when you're out of range and you're like, I want to ready an attack. If this if that creature gets within range of me, I'm going to attack. Uh, typically called uh, holding my action. Yeah, Master Brewer, help for sure. Yeah, Panda, disengage is such a, a big one, especially early on. Of course, rogues, you hear it all the time because they can disengage as a bonus action. So they're like, I disengage from here. And uh, the couple rogues I've played with, they're like all over the place. They're just skitter popping around the, the battlefield uh, because they can. Um uh, but it's, it's important. Sometimes you get up in there and you're like, well, I'm going to die because I'm going to keep fighting. You know, sometimes you need to, to back off and retreat. Um, searching for stuff, shoving, you know, uh, shove a goblin off of a bridge. Uh, think of other ways of fighting. If you're in those weird situations, try try some of the, the other options there. And they're all listed right there. And you can click them and it tells you exactly how they work. So that's, that's what's nice. Uh, don't forget that that's there. Bonus action. A lot of people get confused of what you can do on a bonus action. A bonus action is a very quick action. And there's only certain things you can do as a bonus action. It doesn't matter if you do your bonus action first or your action. The, uh, the economy doesn't work that way. So, and when you get to spell casting, it, you, you know, you can only cast one spell per round and there's only a very few, a very short list of bonus action spells uh, and those kind of things. But bonus actions is just a, a short thing that happens. So in this case with the barbarian, um, rage is your easily accessed bonus action. If you are fighting with two weapons, you can use, if you took the attack action, you can use a bonus action to make an offhand attack. It doesn't get your your bonuses, but at least does a little bit of damage. You do have to be very specific on the hold action uh, as well. Yes. Um, because you, you can't just say I hold my action and then when the thing gets within range, you say, okay, I'm going to do this, this. No, it's it's very specific. I'm going to hold this and if this happens, that's when this event is going to trigger. Reaction. The most common reaction is an opportunity attack. And this is when, and don't, don't misinterpret this, um, a creature willingly moves out of range of another creature, uh, opposing creature. So barbarians here, goblins here, and that goblin chooses without disengaging to walk away from the barbarian. When he does that, the barbarian, once per round, can say, I want to take an opportunity attack and make one attack against that goblin as it's running away. And you you get that one. And if you hit, good. Now, there are feats uh, like Sentinel. If you hit them, they can't get away now because it stops them from moving because it sets their speed at zero. So there, there's some definite advantages of those kind of things the the important key thing here is that the the move is willing if someone comes up and shoves the goblin out of the uh, away from you you don't get the opportunity attack um and then other you got a few different things uh 
just other things that are available and limited use items. So as a Duogar, I do get a spell to enlarge or reduce myself. It's a, it's a racial trait. So if you're casting a spell, you just you hit use and it'll gray out until you take a long rest. If you have spell slots, you'll see the, the squares there. And when you cast a spell, it'll take up a spell slot. Looking at your inventory, you can see all those things you saw, that equipment. Attuning to an item. Some magical items that you'll get, you'll have to attune to. And it'll tell you it requires attunement. So you, you pull out the, the weapon. You have to focus on it for at least an hour. And you bond with it and it becomes your weapon. And you say uh, it'll pop up over here on the side. And you attune to that weapon. Let me see. Manage inventory. Um, let me. We'll add Whelm. So if I look at Whelm. It's got charges. And I'm going to wield it. And as soon as I say that I'm going to wield it. They can be stolen, yes. Uh, but if someone tries to use a, an unattuned weapon, it just it acts as a normal weapon. It doesn't do anything special. It doesn't get any of the bonuses or anything like that. So once you attune to it, it'll pop up here. And most characters can only attune to three items at a time. This is a built-in mechanic so that you don't have uh, a character walking around with... 15 uh, attuned items and they're just a magical juggernaut that can't be stopped. Uh, yes, you can choose to unattune to it. Yep. Uh, you just It's like breaking concentration. You just say, I'm not attuned to this anymore. doesn't take any special time or anything like that. Once it's attuned, it's there. So you do have to do a little bit of management and of what you, if it's stolen, yeah, you can break the attunement. Uh, same thing. So that's what attunement is. The, uh, the artificer actually gets, I think five or six attunement slots. So they, they get extra ones. They're the only class that gets those like that. As we go on, features and traits. These are just more information about your character, uh, your traits, dark vision, whether you can see in the dark or not, sunlight sensitivity, those kind of things, any kind of resistances where you get these advantages, those things. Class feature, which ones are class, which one are racial, and then feats. As you begin progressing and leveling up, you will get to a point where you have you can choose between increasing an ability score, which you should, in my opinion, uh, always try to get your primary stats to 20 as soon as possible. Uh, you can put one in each. So if I was doing this, I could put one in constitution, uh, any of the odd ones, and one in strength, and then next time maybe one in dex and one in strength. Um, or you can choose a feat, and there are tons of feats to pick from. And you should always get approval from your DM, because some of the feats are kind of BS. I'm looking at you, lucky feat. Um, but see if your DM allows that particular feat, and then go from there. My, my only rule for feats uh, is that they make sense. Um, what can make you go over 20? Uh, Magical weapons, so or or items. So, if we look at, let's go back to our inventory. Uh, that one doesn't. There are there are a couple items that are out there. Uh, well, let's see. Like potion of hill giant strength or belt of hill giant strength. Uh, you're setting things, your strength to 21, um, or it's a consumable that sets it up to that. Feats will not. You cannot increase your feats over 20 with a feat. 
So some of the feats will give you stat abilities as well as other ones, but they will not push it over 20 because it's just something physical that you're allowed to do. Has to be items. Typically, it's going to be like potions and stuff. Um, like here, Belt of Cloud Giant Strength requires attunement. Set your strength score to 27. From, from there, your, your modification. Let's add that in there. Let's add that and we'll use it and attune to it and you can now see my strength score is 29 because not only does it set it to 27 but i also get my racial bonus to that giving me a plus nine modifier to strength ah for a five player group just starting out what classes would you recommend um i would recommend a, a martial class of some sort uh whether that be paladin, a fighter, uh, someone to, to kind of stand out and, and take some hits and kind of push enemies back. Some sort of healer, like a druid, uh, a bard, an artificer, or a cleric. Um, a, a long long range spellcaster uh, for those utility things. Things that would be have like identify spells or some sort of transportation. Um, and having some rogue type like a bard or, or a rogue itself, someone who can pick locks or uh, traps, uh, uh, disarm traps, those kind of things. Those are kind of the common ones that I would say are great for a, uh, a five player group. Monk, monk is good. Yeah, if you as that martial class that stands out there, I, I play a monk in a, a, another campaign as a player and monks start out slow. They the classes have have a creep right some like rogues start out really really strong and then they kind of taper down as where a monk starts out low and they taper up they don't hit hard but they hit a lot and they're, they're once they get higher level it's like you can't kill them they they just take massive amounts of, uh, of things because they can take uh, as a bonus action they can take the dodge patient defense with a key point and then they have disadvantage over anything that would attack them. So it's like, bring it on. You have disadvantage if you're going to hit me. So yeah, monks are a good one. No problem, Corvus, for sure. That's that's what I would uh, recommend uh, for those classes. Cleric is a good multi-class one, as, as Skoski was saying. Um, clerics, a lot of people think clerics because video game. And that, that's what we fight in the D&D world is... People think D and D is like a video game, and and video games have really devalued some of the old classic classes. But they're like, oh, clerics are healers. They're they're squishy. I mean, I'll give you an example. In EverQuest, when you played a cleric, they were plate wearing. They were the classic um, hardy. I'm gonna I'm gonna beat you up and heal you at the same time kind of class. And then WoW came and made them. Uh, now we got a priest. They're squishy, but they heal really good. So it, it's kind of changed it. Clerics are freaking mean in D&D. Um, not only do they have a really high AC and a really good uh, list of spells that they can use offensively and def defensively, you can never go wrong having a cleric in your party. Um, all right, about combat rounds. In round X, a player has zero HP with that player still go during that round yes so when a player is knocked unconscious which means they are at zero hit points when it's their turn in combat they don't get to take an action because they are incapacitated which means they get no actions or reactions and they have to make a death saving throw they roll a d20 that gets no modifiers and if it's a 10 or higher it's a uh it's a success and if it's lower than 10 it's a failure after three failures, your character is dead dead. Requires resurrection or rolling up a new character. If it's three successes, they are stabilized at zero hit points, meaning they don't die, but they uh, they don't stand back up and start fighting again. Yes, uh, half-orc, when they hit zero one time, they can stand back up and uh, start fighting again. 
Oh, one cleric per party. <laughs> so the the interesting thing is if you make a death saving throw and get a natural 20, you actually do go back to one hit point and can stand back up and, and start fighting. And if you roll a natural one, it is two death saving throws that are failures. Uh, if you are hit with a melee attack while you're incapacitated, it is two death saving throws because it's an instant critical hit, which is too safe. So you do not want to fall down to zero hit points while surrounded by a bunch of goblins and all your friends are elsewhere. So that would be... Um, that would be awkward. All right. While, while you get that up, Panda, we'll, we'll continue on here. Uh, features and traits. That's all your, your class where we talked about those. Descriptions. That's where we made our alignment and our gender and, and what our character looks like and kind of their character flaws. Notes is where you can add your notes. This is where you would write your notes and, and those kind of things and your backstory. And then extras is uh, pets and mounts and things. Yes. Yes, Corvus. They are immediately down. Um, they're immediately incapacitated. All right. So that's the that's the core sheet. And then short rest. We've been talking about short rest and long rest. When you hit short rest, um, you choose if you want to use any hit dice. You get one hit die uh, per level that you have, plus your constitution mod to regain hit points. So without using a potion, you say, we're going to take a short rest. I'm going to use two hit die for my barbarian. Roll that up. So I get 19 plus 8, because it's plus 4 for each one. So I get 27 hit points back, which put it there, and I take my short rest. Don't forget to hit it the second time for the confirm. On a long rest, you'll see there is a checkbox here that says reset maximum HP during the rest. By raw rules, whenever you take a long rest, your hit points go back to maximum. I think it's a little weird. It's something we don't we do a little differently in our campaign. I'm not gonna dive into it here because it's a different, definitely a, a different rule set. But uh, it seems weird that a dragon bites your arm off and, and you crawl away with one hit point, and then you take eight hours of sleep, and it's like, hey, my arm's back, everything's cool. You know, it just it's one of the the flaws of the system. All right, what we got here? Um, one sec on that Corvus, uh, and we'll get to that one. About combat rounds. In round X, a player just went to zero hit points. Now it is that player's turn in the same round. No, they they would not have their normal action before they go down. A as soon as they hit zero hit points, they are down down. They are on the ground. Um, because they once you once you hit zero, you're incapacitated. There's there's no delay, even though it's uh, the, it's happening in those six second. Uh, rounds uh and corvus how does hd work if you multi-class hit die um Sikoski, are you still on here because uh he he actually runs a multi-class fighter and monk and i believe you roll you'll have based on how many levels you took in monk you'll have the monk hit dice that you can use and how many you took in, say, fighter, you'll have the fighter hit dice to use, and you have to pick which ones that you want to use. So that's how that would work, Corvus. Good, good feedback. I appreciate everybody uh, chatting it up tonight. These are some really, really good uh, questions coming in. No problem, no problem. So that is it. And then, uh, so you've been fighting, you've been killing goblins, you've been venturing into the dark, darkest depths of the land, and you finally get to your next level. When you go in to, to level up, no matter whether it's 
XP or whichever, you're going to click this little anvil, go to the builder. It's going to take you right back to here. And then you can say, okay, I'm level four now. So you set yourself to level four, roll up that hit point dice. So for this one's a D12, get a 10. I'm gonna add that. So now I'm at 38, which with my constitution modifier sets me at 54. And then look down for any of those blue highlighted abilities. And here's where I can choose whether I want a feat or ability. So if I go to that feat, and I choose a feat, and there are a bunch of them. So, but I know I want to do ability score improvements. I want to do one in constitution. We'll do, see, it won't even let me put one in strength because of the gloves, because strength is above 20. So I'll go dexterity. And then I can just click my sheet over on the side. And you can see now my constitution's there got my hit points and everything is good okay everything's automatically added up so that is uh, that is the basics of creating a character in D&D &D Beyond if there are no more questions uh, we're going to do some more of these coming up in the near future the next one will probably be some tips on uh, DMing a, a, a campaign, uh, including using the encounter builder, uh, picking the right monsters for the party, um, kind of some just general rules and, and where things are, and those kind of things. Uh, always feel free to come by. We stream our campaign at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, twitch.tv slash 7 dungeons. Uh, our homebrew campaign every Monday. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the stealth rule. Uh, what's your question about it? Rogues, rogues, rogues and their stealth. Ah. Uh. It's just a missed rule. I'm not sure. I know. Oh, are, are you talking for uh, sneak attack or stealth in general? Okay, let's see here. I. Yeah, uh, Corvus, we will take a look at that here. Seeing what Panda's asking here. I'm not sure I'm understanding. Actually have a polearm master here, so I think. Ah, okay. How stealth, stealth works in general. Um, so, so we do it a, a little bit, uh, it depends on what's going in. So if you have a single character stealthing into a room, they roll a stealth and the DM would have a DC of at what point the other things in the room would detect them. If there are other, um, if there are other NPCs in the room, a lot of times what I'll do is roll their perception checks to see if they see that character. If the perception checks roll above what the stealth roll was for the character, that NPC would see the character entering the room. In a group situation where they want to move quietly, I take all the stealth rolls that were rolled and we average that number out and they move as a group. 
So it, it kind of the the weak stealth players offset the the stronger stealth players. Where it gets uh, a little different is if someone rolls a natural one, because that person is tripping over their feet or kicking rocks or something like that. Um, so that's how we handle stealth in, in our campaign. Yeah, thank you for that follow. Uh, pull arm master. So let's go to features and traits. We'll just manage feats. And so we've got, uh, yeah, the conversation has been great. Uh, sorry for some of the ones I'm not interested. I'm running out of uh, a little bit of steam here. Uh, Polar Master, you can keep your enemies at bay with reach weapons. So whenever you level up, so we'll let's level up Boil here. Um, we got he's got an ability score improvement here. We're gonna go to Feet, and it's that Stealth as a condition effect is just missed okay well uh, i'll look at that here in a second panda let's get polearm master in here all right you keep your enemies at bay with a reach weapons which are pole arms of course when you take the attack action and attack with only a glaive halberd quarterstaff you said quarterstaff uh or spear you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. This attack uses the same ability modifier as the proper, uh, primary attack, and the damage die is a D4 and deals bludgeoning damage. Um, so basically, you're stabbing, pulling it out, and turning it like a monk and hitting that. So with a quarter staff, it's blunt on both ends. Um, as per Rawl, the way it's written, the the backside would still be just a D4 bludgeoning damage. It wouldn't even it wouldn't be the damage of the weapon itself, or or anything like that. Is how I would rule it. Well, okay, Panda, like you, you have me confused there. Yeah, stealth isn't a condition, so I was like, oh no, what am I missing? Um, okay. Oh, how would it show on the DM? Okay, um, no problem, no problem. Uh, so we're going to add it here. Uh, we added it to boil, and I'm going to go over to the character sheet. And now, if we scroll down under actions, right here, you'll see arm master when you take the action it all shows up there and you can see the damage dice comes up as a d4 and then if we go to reactions because there's a secondary part of the polearm master and you you can see here that even under the reactions it's got polearm master opportunity attack so it's got uh, the the dice so I can roll that up for the for that d4 damage but here's the second part of the feat while wielding it. Um, you provoke an opportunity attack when they enter your reach, which is really uh, overpowered if you pair that with a bugbear. Because a bugbear naturally gets an additional five feet of reach because they have long arms. And then if you have them wield a pole arm, you get 15 feet of reach, which is a little stupid. So um, with this feat... <laughs> So that's that's where that would show up. So it's it's under uh, and you can see the actual attack there under attacks. So there's your bonus action attack. So you can roll it up and then hit your one D three plus three. And then if you provoke the opportunity attack, you can you can hit that as well. Ah. Awesome. I love Eldritch Knights. Uh, 
I was saying earlier on one of my when I first started playing 5e that was my first one and I, uh, the party was like oh I can't believe you're you're playing one of those they're awful and then uh, when you cast shield when something attacks you and your AC goes through the roof they're like oh yeah yeah so and a uh, and sword and board with a quarter staff yeah that would be that would be fun that would be fun. All right. If there's no other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to me at uh, at dressed in one on Twitter. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, you can find us on YouTube uh, as well. The cap of fall. OK, no problem. No problem. Panda it is 20 D6. So level 20 PC that has a higher hit dice of six to survive cap of fall oh okay so i i don't follow the uh rules as written when it comes to falling damage because i think it's silly that it maxes out because there's an obvious difference for like even mathematically for terminal velocity if if you fall um so far eventually the hit you know it's the farther you fall, the more it's going to hurt. Um, so it's, it's based off. It just continues adding a D six every 10 foot, uh, as it goes down. That's how we handle it. So if you jump off a cliff, uh, even at level 20 as a wizard, you're going to splat on the bottom. You too, uh, Corvus I really appreciate you stopping by. Does that, does that answer your question, Panda? That's how we run it. Um, I don't, I don't like the cap on falling damage. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Catch us on. No, no problem. We hope to see you again. Uh, stop by on, on Monday. We actually, um, when, when we're streaming the, the, the more you watch, you, you earn coins and you, you actually affect the game that we're playing. You can give my players advantage you can cancel uh the natural 20s that i roll against my players uh you can even name a character that'll go into the campaign so we, we try to get the community involved and in, in that kind of stuff so uh, we're going to be doing more of these we'd love to see you come back from those again check us out on youtube facebook uh 70 dungeons uh on your favorite podcast service and always on twitch been great and we can't wait to see you in the dungeon soon